Uh, welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I know we're up against uh, Jeff Zimmerman's presentation, so I uh, you know I was interested in seeing his as well. Unfortunately, he can't be in two places at once, right? Um, but uh, but thanks for coming to mine, and hopefully I I uh, don't disappoint you. So. Uh, okay, so I'm talking about the um, what is a stolen base here? What what goes into a stolen base, and how can we predict the outcome of a stolen base uh, based on some information uh, that that we are collecting now, and, and a number of teams have been collecting for a while. Um, you know, just breaking it down on a very simple, rudimentary level here. We've got the pitcher's first move kind of sets everything in motion. You've got the catcher, you got the pitcher. Uh, and you've got the runner. It's a, kind of three players involved in this for the most part. You've got the infielder who comes in later, four players. Um, and I guess you'd call the umpire the fifth player. But um, then, uh, so everything sets in motion with the pitcher's first move to the plate. Um, let's assume it's a right-handed pitcher for now to keep things simple, uh, and we don't have to worry about a lefty going with a pickoff, a deceptive pickoff move. Uh, so the runner breaks as soon as he sees the, the pitcher uh, break for the plate. Uh, then the pitch comes in, the runner's moving towards second, uh, then the catcher receives the ball, he sets, he throws, delivers the ball towards second base, it gets to second base, you know, all, you know how a stolen base works. I'm walking you through, why are you, why are you walking me through this? I don't know. Um, just, just laying the groundwork here. So the, uh, the pitcher's delivery time is the first piece of information that we're going to be tracking. We're going to break this down into a few different steps here. The first is the pitcher's delivery time, from the time that he breaks for the plate to the time that the ball hits the catcher's mitt. Okay. Then the second piece is from that point where it hits the catcher's mitt, what the, how quickly can the catcher get it to second base, called the catcher pop time. All right. Uh, so, and then the, the, uh, the third piece kind of happening, happening simultaneously is that runner breaking from first to go to second base, how quickly can he get to second base. So we've got kind of two pieces working together against one other piece here. We can quantify each of these individually, and what I'm going to walk you through is exactly, uh, you know, kind of a framework that we've established here uh, to do that. Uh, all right, so talking about pitcher delivery times first. Um, again, pitchers, his first move to the plate until the, the pop of the catcher's mitt. Uh, we've been collecting this at Baseball Info Solutions for a couple of years now. Our video scouts are timing these um, uh, for every single pitcher delivery time. Uh, of course, I alluded to righties versus lefties earlier. Um, what we found, found is that for right-handed pitchers, uh, the, the trends that we see here are very clear uh, that we're going to be seeing in the next few slides. For left-handed pitchers, it gets uh, a bit hazier. Um, sometimes you've got base runners who will go on the first move. Sometimes you've got base runners uh, who they'll wait to take off on their stolen base until they make sure the, the left-handed pitcher is not coming their way with a pickoff throw. Um, and, and the whole relationship between the pitcher and the runner just kind of clouds it for left-handed pitchers. So we're going to focus on right-handed pitchers today. Um, the average right-handed pitcher delivery time uh, out of all the times we've collected on a stolen base attempt is about 1.43 seconds. Uh, I'll, I'll take questions at the end here. I'll, I'll take the questions at the end. We'll, we'll come back to them. Sorry, we're, we're timing it through our proprietary software. Is the short answer. Uh, we've we've got our uh, we've got a stopwatch built into our computer while we're watching the game. Um, the uh, okay, so that's the average time. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, this is something that scouts have been doing and teams have been doing for for years and years and years, right? Uh, one advantage that we have is we're doing this off of video. Uh, which a number of teams have been doing as well. But compare that to a scout who's sitting in the stands with a stopwatch. You know, he's got a reaction time delay there. There's not a, an opportunity to go back and, and replay, uh, replay the whole pitch to, to get a more accurate time, whereas doing this off of video, we have those advantages. So uh, the 1.43 is, is the average of the times that we've collected on the stolen base attempts. Uh, we can plot this against caught stealing rate, uh, as we've done here. So if you compare the pitcher's delivery time to the caught stealing rate on those stolen base attempts, you see a pretty clear trend here. Um, when the pitcher's quicker to the plate, as you'd expect, they're throwing out more, the catcher is able to throw out more, a higher percentage of the runners. Uh, in the extremes here, we go from 40%, uh, a little bit over in the, in the extreme extremes, uh, down to about 10% or a little bit under when the pitcher takes a, a very long time to get the ball to the plate. So one aspect of the running game that's been kind of underappreciated is the pitcher's effect on controlling, on, uh, on controlling the outcome of a stolen base attempt. So 
uh, you can see right here that we go from a 40% uh, caught stealing rate to a 10% caught stealing rate just based on the pitcher's delivery time before it even gets to the catcher. The next piece, now that the ball's gotten to the catcher, is the catcher's pop time. Uh, how quickly can that catcher get the ball back to, uh, to get to second base and try to beat the runner? Uh, this is something we've been collecting for a few years as well. The average pop time uh, in our database is about 1.95 seconds uh, on these stolen base attempts. Um, you know, a kind of an important little side note here that we're going to set aside for now um, is that catchers uh, don't complete a, a catchable and timeable throw in about 27% of stolen base attempts. So that's when the catcher just doesn't even get the throw out of his glove. You know, he, he's not able to make the transfer cleanly, or he realizes the runner just got too good of a jump. He just pockets the throw anyways. He throws it into center field, and we're not able to, to define the end point of that time very accurately. Uh, so it's a good portion of the time. So uh, the runner is safe on 27% of opportunities, uh, you know, based on this, this sample of data looking at stolen base attempts of second base with a right-handed pitcher. Uh, before we even consider whether there's a play at second base. Uh, we can draw a similar graph to we, that we did with the pitcher delivery times. Uh, the catcher pop times, is, again, there's a, a little bit of a trend there. Uh, not a very steep curve, actually, which is kind of interesting. And that's kind of one of the, the first takeaways here from, from our research with these times is that even from the extremes, the 1.7 pop, pop times, sometimes you can go a little bit faster than that, uh, all the way to the 2.25s, you're, you're ranging from you know 40% to 25%, which is even you know a smaller range than the pitchers had in their delivery times in the caught stealing rates. Uh, so one thing that we found uh, analyzing the data a couple different ways is that pitchers can have a larger impact than even catchers can on the outcome of the stolen base attempts. Uh, so that's another kind of interesting theme that we're, we're finding through this data or we're confirming through this data. Uh, okay, but, and again, you see this, this slope is not quite as steep as the previous one was with the pitcher delivery times, right? Uh, okay, lastly, we have the stolen base times. Uh, again, from the pitcher's first move until the runner touches second base, uh, when he first touches second base, not when he slides past it and then reaches back and, and has to crawl back before the tag gets there. Um, we've been collecting, we started collecting this last year. Um, the average is about 3.52 seconds uh, when there's a right-handed pitcher on the mound on these stolen base attempts. All right, so we're, uh, we can draw a similar line here. It's got the reverse trend, right? The longer the runner takes, the more likely he is to be out. Um, so we see a, a nice little linear trend growing here. 3.30 uh, seconds, the elite base runners when they can make it in 3.3 seconds flat. Um, 3.30 seconds is, uh, they're only caught about 10% of the time. The, the catcher and the pitcher have to do everything right to get that guy. It's got to be, uh, you know, you got to have a really strong uh, catcher behind the plate who can throw, make a quick and accurate throw, and you've got to have a pitcher who can deliver the ball uh, very quickly to the plate. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, 3.8 seconds, uh, they're, they're only caught still about 46% of the time on those attempts. Again, you've got to have an accurate throw from the catcher, and, and, uh, and the ball's got to get there in time. And the, the tag's got to be applied quickly. So, uh, of course, there's other factors here. We've kind of skipped over them uh, at first. We've got pitch location. How does uh, caught stealing rate depend on pitch location? Uh, is it easier for the catcher to throw out runners when a pitch is, is in certain locations? We'll take a look at that. Um, pitch type. What about a fastball versus a curveball versus a changeup? Uh, and then lastly is, is catcher accuracy is something that we're, we're going to be looking at in 2014. We're going to start tracking a little bit more information on that as far as where that throw ended up relative to second base. Okay. Uh, so here's pitch location. Uh, from the pitcher's perspective, this is the strike zone is that three by three. Let's see, I've got a pointer here. The strike zone is this three by three grid here in the middle. Uh, and then this is kind of the chase zones outside the strike zone. So obviously on a pitch low, uh, catcher has a much harder time getting at the second base and throwing out the runner in time. His, his arm, you know, the transfer is a little bit harder. Uh, when you put it up here, you know, shoulder height or, or so, uh, the catcher, it's, it's part of his natural motion uh, to get the ball to second base. You know, he's got to go through that area anyway, so it makes the transfer easier for him. Um, so this is what our data is showing there. Pitch type, there's a variation here. Um, 
you know, knuckleball is kind of interesting, but I think, you know, there's obviously only a certain number of pitchers who throw the knuckleball and a certain number of catchers who caught the pitchers who threw the knuckleball. So uh, that's a, a little bit of an interesting one there. But you can tell on a curveball, much harder to throw out a runner than on a fastball or a cutter, for instance. Okay. Um, so the next step we wanted to do was we wanted to take the catcher's time and the pitcher's time, add them together, and compare that to caught stealing rate. Uh, and we got a stronger trend here. We were accounting for more of the difference. Uh, so we go from at you know the 3.0 seconds or so uh, combined time uh, at about 45% caught stealing rate um, at the extremes there, all the way down to 10-15% uh, uh, at the uh, slower end of the spectrum for their combined times. All right, so you probably see where we're going with this next, right? Well, we'll what if we compared this combined time? to the, the base runner's time. And, you know, in theory, if the ball gets there before the base runner, you can get him out. Um, well, it's not quite that simple, of course, right? Uh, what we found is that if, if the catcher and the pitcher's time here at the 0.0, .0 mark, if the catcher and the pitcher's time subtracting the base runner's time, if, so essentially if they're equal, uh, you still only catch them about 12% of the time. You know, the throw's got to be spot on or you've got to have the runner overslide the base. Uh, something like that to get the guy out. Um, the, uh, what turns out to get to about a 50-50 mark is between about 0.20 and 0.25 seconds ahead of the runner. So depending on you know, where, that, where that throw is, if it's you know, spot on, in the, uh, it, you know, on, the, on the correct side of second base and, and low enough where the tag is easy to apply or it's already you know, in, in a great tagging position for the sliding runner, um, you know, you can have a relatively little lag between when the infielder receives the ball and, and when the runner is tagged out, or, or the tag is applied at least. Uh, or if you, you know, if the infielder has to reach up here, he's got to bring the ball all the way down and takes him a little bit longer to do that, and, and that's costly. So, um, you know, a couple of interesting points. We've got another graph like this uh, on the next slide. And, and on the extremes here on the left-hand side, there's uh, some pretty small samples, but you can see kind of a, a curve here forming. It's pretty linear in this area, but it kind of smooths out because, of course, you can't, you can't throw out a negative percentage of runners or, a, or a over 100% of runners. Um, but, uh, but we've got kind of a nice curve here. And if you, if you fit a logistical regression curve to that, um, you'll find, you know, I'll highlight a couple of interesting points. We talked about the, uh, the zero net time. So when the catcher and the pitcher combined it for the same amount of time it took the base runner to get there, we're still at a, you know, what, 15%, uh, 12, 10 to 15% uh, caught stealing rate at that point. Uh, and then I'll also point out this blue rectangle indicating the intersection with the curve here, uh, which is about the 50-50 mark. And that's with about a 0.25, about a quarter of a second lag uh, between when the ball gets there and when the runner gets there. Okay, so uh, we can do a few things with this. Uh, one of the things is compare this to, uh, is, is to build a, uh, an expected stolen base success rate model and to compare that to a break-even threshold and figure out whether it's a good idea for a runner to be running or to attempt a stolen base in the first place based on excuse me, based on the pitcher, the catcher, and the base runner, um, and some of the other factors we've alluded to here, uh, you know, the pitch type and location, et cetera, um, is there a way that, you know, we can combine that information and decide whether it's a good idea to give the runner the green light give, or, or put the red light on if you're one of the managers or the coaches? Um, or somewhere in the middle, give them a yellow light, you know, go only if you get a good jump kind of thing. Um, we can apply some run values. Here's the run values for our sample of data here. Um, a stolen base added about 0.17 runs for the offense. A caught stealing subtracted 0.39 runs. You know, that's a little bit higher in magnitude, of course, because not only are you not getting the base, but you're removing a runner from the base paths as an out entirely, right? Um, so the difference is about, you know, a little bit over half a run, the difference between a stolen base and a caught stealing. Uh, and if you do a simple little algebra, you can get about a 0.7, a 70% break-even rate. So in an average situation, you might say that uh, out of the sample that we selected here with the, uh, with the steals of second base against right-handed right pitchers, you would need to be 90, or I'm sorry, 70%, more than 70% uh, efficient with your stolen base attempts for it to be a positive event for your team. 
if you're stealing at a 50-50 clip, of course, you're, you're below, uh, you're, you're actually costing your team more runs than you're gaining with your stolen base attempts. So, uh, we've, we've discussed with uh, a number of people this red light, green light concept that, we were, that I was alluding to just a minute ago. Um, should the runner be given the green light to steal or to attempt to steal, uh, or should he not? Uh, this is something that, uh, that is, you know, is an in-game decision that managers, coaches, base runners are facing all the time. And, and we can build a model, you know, based off of what we've just developed here. We've got the information that we can build a reasonably accurate model. Uh, and of course, keep in mind that that catcher is not making a, uh, a valid throw, a, not making a throw or a, an accurate throw to second base 27% of the time. And factor that into your analysis as well. Um, and what, you know, for each pitcher, catcher, runner combination, uh, what is the expected uh, stolen base success rate or the caught stealing rate, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and of course, the last uh, kind of element is this, is in a certain situation, the break-even rate uh, in which you might be willing to run will be different than, than in another situation. If you're facing... Um, if you're facing an elite closer in the ninth inning where one run makes the difference between a win and a loss, uh, you might be more aggressive on the base pass uh, as opposed to a situation where uh, you're in a high offensive environment early in the game and that one run isn't as important. Um, so the break even, it's important to kind of note that the break even rate uh, depends on a number of things uh, in, in, in the game as well as, you know, kind of your individual manager and coach's preference and tolerance for those sorts of things. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a few examples that we've put together here. The first is maybe the most famous stolen base in history, um, certainly in Red Sox fans' mind, right? Uh, Dave Roberts in 2004 comes in to pinch run. Uh, Mariano Rivera's on the mound, and they need this run to tie the game and to extend the series and go on to win the World Series. Um, but they're down three games to none, and Dave Roberts comes in to pinch run, and Mariano Rivera's on the mound, Posada's behind the plate. Now, this is before we were collecting any of these times, so um, we, we went through and, uh, and timed these actu this actual event, uh, but we also have kind of, you know, for Rivera, we have his average delivery time uh, in more recent years, which was actually pretty consistent with what he had on this particular pitch. Um, Jorge Posada in his later years was certainly not as quick uh, to second base with his pop times as he was uh, on this particular instance. He actually had a really impressive pop time, got the ball, because, you know, maybe in part because everybody in the entire ballpark and the entire country knew that Dave Roberts was put in to do one thing, and that was to steal second base. So Posada was ready for that, and he, he for his part, to his credit, uh, got the ball to second base incredibly quickly. Uh, but when you've got Mariano Rivera taking over a second and a half to get the ball to him in the first place, uh, and you've got Dave Roberts, who can steal. In this case, he got to second base in under 3.3 seconds. Uh, you're not going to be able to throw that guy out very often, even if your throw is you know, spot-on accurate, as it was very accurate in this case, and it was a bang-bang play, but Dave Roberts uh, beat the play. There was a, you know, if you plug it into our logistical equation there in our model, uh, you get about a 17.5% caught stealing rate. Um, the very, you know, an 82, 83% success rate uh, for that stolen base attempt. And in that particular situation, uh, the break-even threshold is even lower than the average. Um, so it was, you know, obviously the right decision and, and made a big difference in hindsight, of course, but uh, certainly can't attribute the whole, uh, the whole season to that. Uh, but a couple more examples here. The, uh, we had the pleasure of seeing two matchups between uh, possibly the fastest runner that we've seen in recent history. Uh, Billy Hamilton. Billy Hamilton, as you see here, takes about 3.31 seconds uh, to get to second base on his stolen base attempts in the majors last year. Uh, that was the best in the majors. Uh, he only had a, a couple, a about a dozen stolen base attempts last year, uh, but he's already at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, actually, Jared Dyson, it's interesting, Jared Dyson of the Royals is uh, just right behind him, actually, by a fraction of a second, but doesn't get nearly the, the publicity that Billy Hamilton does. Um, but, uh, but so we had Billy Hamilton going, on, going up against the Cardinals' elite defensive catcher, Yadier Molina. And Molina, his pop time is not actually that outstanding. Um, it's, it's good. It's better than average. If you remember from a few, few slides ago, we, about, we had about a 1.95 as the average for catchers. Um, 
but, uh, but he's also, you know, he's very accurate and certainly one of the harder guys to run on uh, overall. And in the first showdown between these two, we had Seth Manus on the mound. And Manus actually gets the ball home to home very quickly, fairly quickly compared to average. Uh, and our algorithm predicts a 37 or 36% caught stealing rate in these cases. Uh, turns out Billy Hamilton was safe, okay? Uh, still a high percentage of success, but you know, it, depending on the situation, this may or may not be worth, uh, worth the risk. All right, so part two, we had um, Mujica on the mound for the Cardinals, their closer, um, at least for part of the season last year. Uh, Molina and Hamilton, those pieces didn't change. We know what their, their average times were. Uh, we can plug in uh, a different pitcher here and we get a different answer, right? Uh, he takes a little bit longer to get the ball to home plate, and so that expected caught stealing rate goes down uh, under 10%. So we've got over a 90%, um, uh, over 90% 90, 90 expected success rate for Billy Hamilton in this situation. Um, against, you know, an average pitcher, frankly, 1.44 seconds about the league average and a, and a very good catcher. So that just gives you a picture of how how tough it is to throw out uh, a guy like Billy Hamilton and with his speed. Uh, he was again safe. Billy Hamilton, uh, you know, two for two against Yadier Molina. Um, we wanted to give you one more example. Um, I don't know why A.J. Przinsky was stealing a base, but he was. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, you, it was against James Shields and Adam Moore. Uh, it was, Shields was a little bit faster than the league average, Adam Moore was two hundredths of a second faster than the league average uh, based on their average times. Uh, Pierzynski still uh, had one stolen base attempt last year that we timed and uh, it was 4.16 seconds. Plug that in the model and you get a, uh, well, it's not a pretty picture. Uh, and it, he, as you might expect, he was not successful. I know, big shock. but. 91% uh, expected caught stealing rate, and he was, he was uh, in fact caught, so. Um, in conclusion, to wrap up here pretty quickly, uh, we've, we've built this model here. We're, we're gonna be factoring in some other, um, some other pieces there that I've listed at the bottom, the, the pitch type, location, count, and, and the catcher's accuracy into this model as well. But, you know, what our goal was here in building this was to build a model to predict uh, stolen base success rate, which we've done. Uh, and be able to provide that um, to, to teams or to whoever, you know, that's a tool that a team could be using uh, to kind of decide who should have the green light in which situations. Uh, if we've got this pitcher-catcher combo on the mound, you know, which of our runners should be given the green light in the right situation and, and what situations should they be given the green, you know, each runner, what situations should they be running and what situations should they not? Uh, and in what situations should we, uh, is it somewhere in the middle? Um, you know, the other aspect of this is we can better isolate the impact of pitchers, catchers, and base runners on stolen base prevention and or success in the case of the base runners. Uh, separating the catcher's credit from the pitcher's credit in their overall control of the running game is, uh, is, has been a challenge, frankly. Um, we've, we've done it a few different ways, but now that we, with these times, we can isolate exactly well, Jorge Posada, he got the ball to second base very quickly, but Mariano Rivera took forever. So we can, in fact, we could give Posada positive credit for an event where it didn't even work out uh, because of other players involved, you know, in this case, Rivera taking forever to get the ball to home plate. Uh, okay, and then I wanted to give a special shout out to a few people. Our, our video scouts are the ones who are collecting uh, this information on our operations crew. They do a, a lot of great, a lot of great work at BIS um, and, and collecting these accurate times. Um, wanted to thank Joe Rosales and Scott Spratt who are over here. Uh, Joe put together most of the data for this presentation in entire honesty and I'm up here taking all the credit for it. But, uh, and Scott assisted as well. Scott, uh, Scott and Joe are our R&D department at BIS. Um, uh, I wanted to shout out to uh, two members of teams who have been helpful in helping us collect this data and, and helping us kind of uh, construct this algorithm. Uh, two in particular, Andrew Percival of the Mariners was helpful in, in helping us learn how to collect this information um, in different, different techniques and watching for different things. Uh, and also Daniel Zion of the White Sox who has been helpful in, in helping, uh, giving us suggestions for what they would be looking for. 
Um, and lastly, to Saber for hosting the conference again and, and inviting me to speak. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Yeah, have you been able to differentiate between an actual stolen base attempt and a hit and run a play which has gone awry, which turns into a stolen base attempt, which of course have an obvious effect on a runner's time to second? Right. Um, we've taken the approach of, of collecting the data, whether you know we judge that it was a hit and run attempt or whether it was uh, a pure stolen base attempt. Um, in some cases, it's it's tough to tell, you know, exactly who missed the sign or what the intent of the play was. Uh, and without, um, you know, on the last panel, we were talking about getting inside the players and the coaches' heads and trying to figure out exactly what they're thinking. And uh, we don't have that data yet. So, um, so we, we've taken the approach of of including those right now as data. But you know, maybe that we do we do have a flag that we we. Um, that we can track some of that information potentially in the future and separate that or treat it differently. Hi, Ben. This is a terrific Hi. presentation. Uh, just two Thank questions. Uh, the first, reading Bill James years ago, he, he used to discount base stealing. He, he would basically say it's counterproductive. When I look at your presentation, I'm thinking if you've got a Hamilton or a really good base stealer, it's a no-brainer that this is really going to be productive. So, ha ha I just wanted to get that's my first question, your comment in the backdrop of, you know, how sabermetrics is viewed uh, base stealing. Um, sure. The, I think in the case of a Hamilton, you've got to get him on base first, right? Um, and that's probably the biggest challenge to, to getting him to steal more. Um, it might be a 90% success rate, but if he's only on, on, base, on first base a certain number of times with an opportunity to steal a base, uh, then you're going to be limited in how much you can utilize that. Um, I do think we've gotten better, you know, over the last decade or so at quantifying the impact of base running. And we have a, a reasonable idea of how many runs it contributes plus or minus to a player's value. And, um, and, and we know it's you know, not nearly the same scale as, as offensive production in either direction, but, but it does have value. And it's, you know, in the extreme cases, can be 10 plus runs in a year. Um, on, I'm talking about all base running kind of events, not just stolen bases as well. But, uh, certainly something that we're, we're better able to quantify now than we were before. I guess my, my second question is, many have said that stealing third is easier than stealing second. And I'm wondering, have you done research on from second to third? And if you haven't, uh, or if you have, can you tell us a little bit about it? And if you haven't, is that what you're going to do now? We've, we've tracked the data. It's, um, we didn't break into it for this presentation because the, the sample sizes are a little bit smaller and uh, it, and it's just, it, it muddles the whole waters. In the interest of time, I think we just left it out though. Um, so off the top of my head, I don't have, a, I don't have uh, numbers to give you, but, uh, but yeah, we do have the data. Yeah. Ben, thanks, that was excellent. Thank you. What, what do we do with the 27%? So if we, if we look at the, the pitcher delivery time and the catcher pop time and compare that to the, the base runner speed and, and, we, and we look at A.J. Pruszynski's 9% mm -hmm. success, so what about the 27%? Um, or does that not apply to him because he's so slow that the, the, the catcher's never gonna just hold the ball? You know, that 27% is a little tricky. Um, some of that 27% is uh, a catcher putting the ball in his pocket because Billy Hamilton got a great jump, right? Uh, it's not going to be 27% for AJ Przinsky if it's, you know, it's probably going to be higher than 20% for 27% for, for Billy Hamilton. Um, that's something that that we uh, will will need to analyze a little bit more beyond what we've done here. Um, and you know, I think it could be a, a, a separate piece of this that certainly needs to be added in for sure. Right. The the ones um, the ones that are presented in the in the slides here with the with the graphs are the ones where you know where we only had um, valid times. Right. So in order to produce this net time on the x-axis here, we needed a pitcher time, a catcher time, and a base runner time, and we've excluded the rest of them because then we wouldn't you know we could plug in an average, but then we're just clouding the data a little bit. So. For the catcher pop time, does that include the time from when the ball gets into the infielder's glove and the swipe occurs? 
it's, it's when it gets to the infielder, when it first hits his mitt, not when it's actually applied or the tag is actually applied. Yeah. That's, that's how we've been collecting it, at least. Yeah. You were showing the caught stealing percentages by pitch variety. Pitch type, yeah. Pitch type. Okay. Why was it highest for the knuckleball? That seems very counterintuitive. Um, you know, without looking at it a little bit closer off the top of my head, as I kind of alluded to, the, the, the sample is pretty small there. There's a limited number of pitchers who throw the knuckleball, obviously, and a limited number of catchers who have caught the pitcher who, who throws the knuckleball. So um, I, I think, it's, uh, I think that's, that's my first guess as to why the knuckleball stands out like that. Anything else? <laughs> uh, no, we didn't go back to Ricky Henderson video. Um, yeah, right. No, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Anything else? Left-handed pitchers are trickier, uh, as, I, as I talked about. We, we've collected the data, um, but the trends aren't as clear uh, because the, you know, the base runner's intention is a little bit different sometimes. You know, whether he goes on first move, whether he waits to see if the pitcher's move going home. Um, and frankly, there's not as large of a sample because there's not as many stolen base attempts against left-handed pitchers. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know the answer for left-handed pitchers, uh, but we could, we could try to build a model around it. Yeah. Oh, we got more. Back here. Ben, how much consistency is there in both the, the uh, pop time and delivery time? Like, if, if Yadier and Molina is, you know, 1.8 seconds on average, is that plus or minus, you know, a tenth of a second, or is it pretty much spot on? You know, it's, it does vary a bit um, on, on a play-by-play -play basis, uh, you know, and I think that can be a product of the type of pitch that's thrown, the location that it's thrown. Um, how much they were, you know, in the case of Posada, everybody in the building knew that, that Dave Roberts was going to steal, so he was able to anticipate and get his body in position uh, before the pitch was even thrown, right? So um, it does vary uh, a bit on a pitch-by-pitch on -pitch basis, on a play-by-play -play basis. Yeah, very good presentation, very good. Thank you. Um, just drifting a little bit away from it, though, do you think with this information, What's your feeling? Do you think teams will be using the stolen base more than they have in the last few years, or, or less, or how do you think it'll be it'll be used? I uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think the um, I certainly feel like I have a, a better understanding of how stolen bases um, how to how to um, quantify the expected success rate on stolen bases uh, now. Looking using all of this data. Um, I know coaches, you know, coaches and scouts and teams for years have been collecting this kind of information and making decisions based off of it. Uh, so I wouldn't expect that they're going to change their decisions, you know, dramatically. Uh, I think this could just be a tool to help them make better decisions. You know, maybe they're running in some situations where they maybe shouldn't. Maybe they're not running in some situations where it makes more sense to run. Um, so other than that, I don't know, though. Were you able to see what effect a pitch out had on the, the success rate? Uh, we didn't look at pitch out specifically here, but we certainly could. We, we have pitch outs designated as a, actually a specific pitch type on here, so uh, we certainly could. Did you have something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, which catchers have the uh, fastest pop times and which are some of the catchers that have the worst? Um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the top list. Uh, I know that um, a lot of the guys who have reputations as good defensive catchers do have the fastest pop times. And uh, I, I don't remember what Weeder's mark was, frankly. If it, that's what you said, Weeder's. Um, I, uh, I know that... Um, Uh, right, so adding on to what Scott said there, uh, you know, Molina in his case can uh, can ramp it up. He can go faster when he needs to. With Billy Hamilton there, he can deliver a faster pop time. 
uh, and he takes his time a little bit more, gets a little bit more accurate throw uh, when he has more time if he's throwing out AJ Przinsky or something. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Hey Ben, uh, did you look to see at all whether the the catcher's pop time or the pitcher's release time varies based on the base runner speed? Uh, we we have looked at that, and it and it does, um, and that's an, an important variable I neglected to mention. Um, we've you know with a with a base running threat, um, they do uh, pitchers do tend to deliver the ball to the plate faster. With AJ Brzezinski over there, they tend to take a little bit more time, as you might expect. Um, and what we've done for this analysis to somewhat account for that is limit the average times to on stolen base attempts only. So, uh, you know, we've still got some A.J. Przinsky stolen base attempts in there, but those are a small, a very, very small portion of the sample that we've used here. Anything else? I don't know how we're doing on time, but I think we're good. Okay, well, thank you very much.